thank you again for joining us to celebrate the SDG Action and Awareness Week. This is an innovative sponsored program by the University Global Coalition, coordinated by President Angel Cabrera. It is designed to get students and educators more familiar with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs, and inspire them to take action to advance the goals and their on their campuses and in their communities. Georgia Tech's strategic plan specifically calls us to work toward the SDGs as they describe the various kinds of impact we must make to deliver our mission, which is to develop leaders who advance technology and improve the human condition. And of course, our motto is progress and service. Each of our guests here represent organizations that have given generously to improve the human condition from the local to the global. And they have also helped us at Georgia Tech advance our own mission over the years, from which, for which we are very grateful. So today we will hear from, as you heard earlier, um, we're going to hear from Blair, John, Carlos, and Susanna, and we're going to first ask each of our panelists to give us some information about their philanthropic philosophy, the, uh, philanthropic philosophy and priorities. So please introduce yourselves and your foundation's philanthropic philosophy and priorities. We'll start with Blair. Thank you. It is really, really wonderful to be with you all today. Um, my name is Blair Beasley. I am the Managing Director of the Environment Giving Area at the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation. And my work there is really focused on doing our part to help address climate change. Um, the primary focus is around supporting and accelerating the clean energy transition and working to ensure that the benefits of that transition um, flow to the communities that we're working in. Um, we're primarily focused in the Southeast and in the West for this part of the work. Um, this year, we actually launched an additional program giving area within the environment team focused on the connection between land use and climate change. And that work right now is just focused in Montana. So I joined the Blank mm -hmm. Foundation last summer after a really meaningful tenure working with John, working for John at the Racy Anderson Foundation and Valerie and the rest of the team. Um, and it's been an exciting time to be at the Blank Foundation um, because in many ways we're starting on a new chapter of philanthropy there. About three years ago, um, the board and Arthur um, really decided to focus some new energy and new giving into five um, strategic giving areas, one of which is the environment. Um, but we're also focused on democracy and youth development, um, mental health and well-being, and a commitment to the historic west side of Atlanta. Um, in addition to that, we're continuing um, giving that's really coming out of our founder-led giving, which really reflects the priorities and interests of our family. Um, so there's lots of change um, going on at the foundation, but I would say our North Star in general, which um, has remained the same, which is to do our part to invest in a world where sustainable and inclusive communities can thrive. Thank you. And you'll find it over time as we go down with our other panelists that they all know each other and have amazing connections. So I'm looking forward to the discussion as well. Carlos. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Georgia Tech for putting this panel together. Uh, my name is Carlos Paguaga, and I'm Senior Director of Circular Economy for the Coca-Cola Foundation. The Coca-Cola Foundation's mission is to make a difference in communities around the world, and we do that by investing in transformative ideas and institutions that are trying to address some of the most challenging problems that we see globally. The foundation approaches that mission through six impact areas sustainable access to safe water, circular economy, climate resilience and disaster preparedness and response, economic empowerment, hometown Atlanta, and employee giving. And we achieve our goals through uh, working with partnerships or through partnerships and then leveraging the power of the Coca-Cola system. 
We have system expertise around the world that the foundation can tap into to help improve the quality of the programs and interventions that we're supporting. And we do this in partnership by bringing together not only implementing partners, but also co-financing partners. So a lot of the work we do, we do in partnerships. And this builds an ecosystem of, of, of interested parties around a, th a theme. So we'll talk more about how some of the, our work in climate resilience comes to life during other parts of the conversation today. Well, John, you're up. Hi, friends. I'd say that my work is to advance the legacy of Ray Anderson. He was the founder of Interface, the carpet tile manufacturing company headquartered here in Atlanta. Uh, and he was also committed for the last 17 years of his life to making his industrial manufacturing company as environmentally sustainable as possible. When he passed away in 2011 and left his estate to this family foundation, it was our work as his family. I'm, I'm lucky to have been one of the five grandchildren of Ray Anderson. Our work is to advance that legacy. We've done that in a number of ways, a few very specific key initiatives that occupy the majority of our funding. One of them is to support the Ray C. Anderson Center for Sustainable Business here at Georgia Tech in the Scheller College, led by Beryl Toktai and Michael Oxman. But another one that I wanna spend a moment on because it informs other parts of this conversation is our very specific contribution in the climate space. A number of years ago, we pulled together some of the best minds in climate that we knew. And we together conceived of the idea of Drawdown Georgia, which is an initiative that is meant to accelerate climate solutions here in the state. Solutions backed by best in class academic research. It began with uh, research that was conducted by Georgia Tech, Dr. Marilyn Brown here, but with the involvement of researchers at Emory University the University of Georgia and Georgia State, and they've identified the most significant climate solutions, the ones that work best in our state, 20 high impact solutions. But the work is more than just academic research. Since that research was published a little over three years ago, we and our friends in this work have been trying to build a movement in favor of climate solutions. And that movement exists with businesses, it exists with communities of faith, but it also now exists with philanthropic organizations. And something that we'll spend some time with this morning is on a collaborative grant making effort called the Drawdown Georgia Climate Solutions and Equity Grant. So what I'd say I'm focused on in my work is to make the state of Georgia one of the leading states for solving the climate crisis and doing so in a way that advances equity creates jobs, promotes human health, and protects the natural environment. Thank you, John. And Susanna, please tell us about Glenn Family Foundation. Good morning. I'm, I'm very happy to be with you here today. I'm the person up here who's not the climate expert. <laughs> uh, I work with a family, small family of four trustees. Um, we have about $120 million in assets, give away about $5 million a year, so relatively small foundation compared to some of the other players uh, in the field. But uh, we, and we have a broad array of giving priorities. We, we give in uh, adolescent mental health, which we're happy to partner some with the Blank Foundation on that. We, um, we also do a lot of food related grant making. We fund Georgia Organics and um, community farmers markets and some of those great organizations out there doing good food work. Uh, and that's kind of the, the path which led us into the climate space. Um, we also have uh, been proud uh, founding donors of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights uh, downtown um, in the middle of a big campaign for expanding that organization. And uh, we have a long history of funding research at Winship. Um, so it's, it's a pretty broad set of giving priorities. The family is, uh, this is a third and fourth generation Atlanta family, so most of our family giving is based in Atlanta. All of the members are here, which is a very fortunate thing for me, actually, because sometimes you go to work for a family and they're flung all over the world, and that makes it a little bit harder to narrow in on those priorities. Um, we do a little bit of giving in Maine as well. But most of our focus has been in Atlanta, and the foundation's been around since about 2000. So that's kind of a big picture of us. That's great. And, and the, the theme here is 
yes, we're focused on the environment and on clean energy, renewables, but there are all of these linkages and connections to health, well-being, equity, and a number of other areas, and we'll hear more about that throughout this panel. Um, Blair, I want to turn to you and ask you a question about um, the particular focus um, and the Blank Foundation on renewable energy, and how have, has that been moving forward? Um, the Blank Foundation, and you are responsible for this portfolio, focuses on reducing climate fueling emissions by supporting clean, electric, and healthy soils. And so tell us a bit more about the Foundation's goals and how you're building this portfolio. Sure. So thank you for that question. So um, as I mentioned, I run the Environment Giving Area at the Blank Family Foundation, and our kind of central priority is to help accelerate the clean transition and we're doing that work primarily in the southeast and in the west um, just a few words on why that was like where we decided to focus so the the board decided they wanted to address climate change and one of the key ways that we can rapidly reduce emissions coming from the US economy is to um, decrease emissions coming from the electricity sector it's our third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the country and also kind of the linchpin of how we're going to decarbonize many other parts of our economy. So when you think about how we want to decarbonize transportation, a lot of that runs through electric vehicles. We want those electric vehicles to run on clean energy. So we are a grant-making organization. So the way we're um, helping to do this work is by making grants to allow our grantees to um, strategically intervene in these systems and try to accelerate. So um, there's three ways I'll kind of share about how we're starting to build out this program and our priorities. Um, one is we're thinking about the transmission system. So these are the, the big lines that connect where we generate power to where we're using it. Um, I kind of think of it as like the interstate system of the electricity sector. And for many, many reasons, we're going way too slow in our build out of transmission, which is really hindering our ability to meet clean electricity goals. So these are things like inefficiencies in how we um, plan for transmission, um, how we pay for transmission, how we permit transmission. And so the Blink Foundation is joining funders across the country to think about the role of philanthropy to try to address those bottlenecks. Um, the second way we're thinking about this is thinking about the role of um, energy policy and energy markets. Um, a lot of this is thinking at the state and the regional level on how we can make changes that will allow us to move faster. I'll give you um, one example, which is, as I mentioned, we're doing a lot of work on the West Coast where there is kind of growing momentum I mean, the state, at the state level to join and create a new wholesale regional um, power market. This is how most of the country actually buys and sells electricity, not how we do it here in Georgia. And for many, there's many reasons why we think that would be beneficial in the West, including the ability to move faster um, and the build out of clean electricity. So we're thinking kind of at a system scale. And then if all of that is way too wonky and people are getting a little bored, um, we really are thinking about how we can bring those benefits to communities and to actual people. Um, one of the things we know when it comes to any major changes is that not all people are likely to experience benefits equally, even if overall we're expecting there to be benefits. And so we're thinking about the role of rooftop solar and batteries and energy efficiency and how those things can help meet community priorities. So things like saving people money on their electricity bills or building community resilience in the face of climate change. Um, so that is um, also part of this kind of thinking on the role. That's excellent. So transmissions, policy and markets, and also communities. And as you said very clearly, grant making. So folks in the audience, hopefully you're seeing ways in which you can engage um, with the Blank Foundation on these, in these areas. Um, Carlos, I want to turn to you. And obviously, a global company that's based and anchored here in Atlanta, um, the foundation's portfolio includes economic empowerment, circular economy, and climate resilience. Continuing on the theme of climate, um, could you talk a little bit about the Foundation's climate resilience portfolio and which countries and types of activities it focuses on? And later I will come back to Atlanta, so you'll get a chance to talk about that then too. Great. 
Thank you, Kay. Um, so the Coca-Cola Foundation's work in climate resilience really looks at two major aspects of climate resilience. First, most people feel the impacts of climate through its impact on water systems. So a, a big portion of our focus is using nature-based solutions to try to address the issues surrounding water systems, whether that's too much water, dealing with floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, things like that, or too little water places, situations like droughts and famines. And so we deploy grants to support nature-based solutions to try to address those challenges. In addition to that, we also do work in sustainable agriculture, working with farmers to reduce the amount of water usage or to help them adapt to the impacts of climate change. Maybe it's helping them learn to plant new crops in areas that have now changed in the soil conditions or the environmental conditions aren't supporting what they were used to growing. So we're working with sustainable ag and then nature-based solutions. On the other side of the house, we have the work that my colleague Roxanne leads around disaster preparedness and response. How do we help communities become more resilient to the impacts of disasters? We made a grant um, in 2022 to the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB Lab, to set up a parametric insurance policy for utilities in the Caribbean. So when a storm happens, normal processes, they, the, whoever's impacted has to file claims with their insurance process, go through this back and forth before they finally get the funding to be able to, to, to address those. What parametric insurance does is say, okay, we'll forget all about that claim stuff. We'll agree that if there's an incident, there'll be a payout. And so this allows utilities more rapid access to the funds they need to, re, to turn back on systems, to fix broken pipes, whatever is the impact of storms. Another area we work in in terms of nature-based solutions, um, two years ago we made a grant to WWF to support a program called Recharge Pakistan. Those of you who might be familiar with Pakistan, they are faced with significant flooding issues in the last few years that have destroyed millions and millions of dollars and killed many, many people. What Recharge Pakistan hopes to do is plant Re, you know, do reforestation efforts, green infrastructure, bioswales, all kinds of interventions to help address the impacts of flooding and thus mitigate some of the damage that it's causing as well as help make those communities more resilient. Another area where we've worked closely with the Nature Conservancy is, is around water funds. We have supported TNC's water funds almost since their first one in Ecuador. Water funds is a really simple concept. It's getting downstream users of water to pay into a fund that goes to conserve and protect the upstream source of that water. And we recently made a grant to TNC to help support water funds across 14 to 20 different locations around the world. And this provides capital for them to fund pilot programs. So when we launch a fund, you collect some money from, from interested parties and then you right away need to find a pilot program, something that you can demonstrate and show the value of, of protecting these upstream sources of water. For some places, that's not a challenge, but for other parts of the world, usually in least developed countries, getting that funding for those pilot programs can be really challenging. So the Foundations Grant is focused on working with other partners to put money into a fund that the water funds could then tap into to fund these pilot programs build the proof of concept and, and, and help them extend the life of these funds and, and really help them accelerate the work that they're doing. So how can members of the Georgia Tech community participate in any one of these? Uh, the one that caught my eye, especially I'm from the Caribbean, um, disaster preparedness and response. Uh, how would that engage members of our community? Well, that's a good question. I think um, I think it's, it's up for discussion. We could look at opportunities where um, there might be some work that y'all are doing in the space that would align with, with helping make communities more resilient to the impacts of disaster. Mm -hmm. But I think that's an area we could explore. So based on the, some of the research or, or that type of thing, that's very interesting. We, we have a bias for action, so we don't fund a lot of work in research, but definitely we have had some programs in the past where, that have included very research component. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and so John and Susanna, I'd love to 
go with you and ask you a question and have you kind of unpack something for us. Um, your two foundations collaborated to distribute climate solutions and equity grants. Could you please talk a little bit about the inspiration for that collaboration and what impact it, it's already having? Why don't I give the history and then I'll let Susanna speak to why it was such a good fit for the Glenn Foundation and how they've engaged in this work and provided a lot of leadership in the equity space. So the history, as we began to think through this movement piece of climate solutions for Georgia, understanding how foundations could come together was a critical piece of it. And it was in a time when the foundation community, the philanthropic community, uh, in particular in the South, had once again realized the importance of racial equity given the history of our state. This is not that long after the murder of George Floyd, and so conversations about equity continued to pop up. And it turns out that many of the climate solutions identified by the researchers can help advance equity. If we do it right, if we solve the climate crisis the right way, we will address some of the systemic and acute challenges in equity, racial equity in particular, that have long plagued our societies. We wanted to come together to make a collective impact in this space. Designing the Drawdown Georgia Climate Solutions and Equity Grants was a process. It was led in significant part by Blair when she was with us, and it involved some external consultants and the input of the foundations that kicked this off in 2022. It was our foundation, but it was also the Candida Fund, the Sapelo Foundation, the Dobbs Foundation, and the Glenn Foundation. And as we went through that process, we realized that it was gonna be critically important to drive dollars to the community-based organizations in our state who were best positioned to localize climate solutions. One of the failures of philanthropic organizations can be to come in from the outside believing that they have the answer. You have to instead empower the community that exists in place, let the people best position given the cultural dynamics of a small community to bring solutions to that community, including climate solutions. And so we designed this program to be a pot of money that our foundation's all committed to, and with the expertise of select experts in both climate solutions and community-based organization equity work, we collectively decided where grants would be made in the state to simultaneously advance these solutions that we know are good for the climate, but good to reduce things like energy burden, food insecurity, and a whole host of other equity-based issues. So I'll stop there and let Susanna speak a little bit to her perspective of participating in this work. Well, I, I first heard John speak at the Carter Center at an event. What was the name of the event? Oh, I don't know. It was, <laughs> it was something. Anyway, he was with Reverend Durley. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, he announced the climate and equity. And I don't know why he didn't call me to begin with. That was my bad. <laughs> so I called him and, and said, we want in because uh, coming from a, a smaller family foundation that's very general purpose kind of foundation, I, I find my colleagues and my trustees, it's hard for us to find a, a place to enter the field because there are a lot of really large organizations, large nonprofit organizations where your grant making feels a little dwarfed. Um, and then there's uh, a lot of um, com complexity to the field, right? There's a lot of different ways you can address climate, and um, it, it can be a bit overwhelming for those of us, I work alone. I don't have a, a Blair Beasley on my staff. Um, so I'm the one who has to know about breast cancer research and all the good food movement stuff and mental health for adolescents and climate. So I'm a generalist, and that's very much uh, the case for many foundations. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, a lot of family foundations like ours stay out of the field. Um, is they're just not comfortable walking in. And so I thought this process for the Drawdown Georgia grants um, was just very accessible. Um, you can understand the work. You can, it's also a very hopeful thing. Um, you know, my trustees are not 
sometimes I feel like I'm just deluging them with bad information, you know, horrible things that are happening in the world. <laughs> and, and, and giving should be, um, you know, something that feeds your soul, right? Uh, something that makes you feel good sometimes. So it can't all be bad. Um, and so I felt like this was a very good way to enter that space. And uh, we had, uh, we've long been interested in civil rights and equity work, but of course the murder of George Floyd and um, the, the sort of things that were happening in 2021 and 22 um, was also pushing us to do more uh, in terms of figuring out how we could reach out to more grassroots organizations across the state. Um, and again, to, to engage the people who are most affected on the ground uh, and have them uh, build leadership in this space because it can't just be experts, it's got to be all of us. Um, so I have seen my role as kind of an evangelist for uh, organizations like ours um, and tried to help bring in some new, new blood to the process that we did a second cohort in 2023 and we're doing a third cohort this year. So that's been kind of the role that, that we've played. I have to follow up because this is our superstar. Uh, she, she is the one who brought to the table the additional funders during the 2023 cycle for this work. It was her network and her willingness to reach out to other foundations who maybe hadn't given in climate, but could also have seen the on-ramp potential of this collaborative that we've done. I also want to give you a very tangible example of like, where are the dollars going for this? And so uh, I'll lift up two of the grants that have been made. We want them to be statewide. We want them to be um, different types of climate solutions. And so one was to fund a partnership between Georgia Organics and Macintosh Seed. Macintosh Seed works in the coastal Georgia region with black farmers. And the partnership has been to provide support so that black farmers are able to access federal funding opportunities for climate smart agriculture practices. They have been hard at work in making sure that many of the farmers who have tried in the past to access federal funds, but have run into roadblock after roadblock after roadblock, can get over those humps and begin to see some of the funds come into their farming communities. A second example out of the first cohort that we funded is the Athens Land Trust. A lot of the climate solution work that has the most immediate impact on equity is to reduce energy burdens. If you weatherize a home, if you make it more energy efficient, the people who live there spend less on their energy bills. What the Athens Land Trust has done is to develop a program that not only increases the number of homes that have access to weatherization, but they do it with what they call their Young Urban Builders Program. And People within the community, maybe their first job, they're getting the training on how to weatherize homes for their community members, coming in and making a difference and learning real life skills. So there's a job training component that comes with it as well. So much is interwoven into the type of work that our foundations is fund are funding. I'm really dang proud of what we've done. Thank you so much, and I'm glad you gave the specific examples because tying equity and climate solutions, it makes sense in our head, but it doesn't make sense to everyone. So you've just given very clear understanding of that. And thank you also, and Carlos, you said this word doing, the doing part. And that is so essential to everything that I'm hearing here, that it's about getting the work done. And that, that's just uh, an important part. Maybe it should go without saying, but I just wanted to underscore how important your work is as a foundation, but actually getting things on action in the field. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, Blair, I want to come back to you about the um, Blank Foundation. And your strongest investment um, is the west side of Georgia, and it's the west of Georgia Tech, and so in terms of our, the connection here um, today. And how do you see the climate work intersecting with your investments in the west side? Thanks, and it's a really nice segue mm -hmm. because it's really about bringing solutions to community, doing work with community. And as Susanna said, you know, it is very intimidating, no matter what size organization you're sitting at, to think about how your organization actually starts to make change. I mean, I talk to people in the federal government who's flowing billions of dollars right now into climate solutions, and they feel like they don't have enough money to move the needle. So I think that feeling is like right on us to change. 
Um, so West Side of Atlanta, um, I think it's helpful to first talk a little bit about what the Blank Foundation is doing on the West Side. Um, that work is being led by my colleague, Danny Shoy, along with Tom Case, who is in the audience, I think. Um, uh, so if anyone has followed questions after, please ask <laughs> Tom directly. Um, but the, the foundation has been um, investing in the west side of Atlanta for many years now. Um, most recently, we really kind of zeroed in both our geographic focus and our intentions to our grant making. So our current portfolio of work is focused um, on two neighborhoods in particular, the English Avenue of Home City um, neighborhoods. And kind of the overall focus is to support really thriving communities where legacy residents have an option to stay in place if they choose in a neighborhood that's thriving. And so um, there's a few different ways that we're thinking about this. One is um, supporting um, an increase in affordable and green housing. Um, and the other is thinking about financial um, mobility. And so I'm um, focusing on adult workforce training um, as well as income enhancement programs. And so how does that overlap with climate work? Well, I think John and Susanna really teased this up nicely because we are starting to think about what kind of programs and the rooftop solar and energy efficiency and battery storage um, could be a good fit for those communities. It's so early days, we haven't done a big project there yet. Um, but I'll tell you what a project could look like. Um, and that is one that has both um, a climate benefit and a community benefit. So something the community actually wants. And um, the reason they may be interested are things that Don and Susanna mentioned. We know that energy efficiency and rooftop solar can help um, lower uh, electricity bills. And these are neighborhoods that have a pretty high energy burden. We could also think about these solutions as ways to build climate resilience. You can think about resiliency hubs. Um, so somewhere that the community can go that has backup power when the lights go out so they can do things like refrigerate medicine or charge their cell phone. And so we're just starting down that journey. And so my team is working closely with Colton and Danny to think about future projects. Thank you. Um, Carlos, I, I, I said we were going to get to the local, right? Um, so we're going to co continue on the local regional impact um, theme that we're in right now. And what are the Coca-Cola Foundation's priorities in Georgia and in the Southeast? Sure, I'll touch on our hometown work specifically. The Coke Foundation funds sort of four big initiative areas in hometown. Uh, one is youth development, and that's everything from K through 12 programs like Boys and Girls Scouts to our support for CHOA, their children's behavioral and mental health program. It also includes work around education and we fund first generation scholarships at virtually every institution in Metro Atlanta, including the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia Tech here, which is a recipient of a grant not two years ago, I guess now, Shalisa, and, and that work includes first-generation scholarships at Ivan Allen. It includes uh, study abroad and term postdoc scholarships at the Sam Nunn School. It includes programs to, to work with Atlanta public school kids, get them scholarships to come to tech. And it also includes funding for students that face some financial challenges, and that could potentially keep them from graduating. So we have supported a fund that helps kids that, that need a little bit of extra support in that area ensure that they're able to graduate. In addition to that, we also do work in arts and culture. We're a pretty significant donor to the Woodruff Arts Center and other arts and culture institutions across the city. And then civic priorities, things like oh, the um, homelessness or any number of initiatives across the city with related to civic initiatives. But I also want to touch a little bit about climate resilience, because we have done work right here in our own backyard. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Cook Park, which opened up on the west side of town. Cook Park is literally in our backyards, all of us here. And that, that is a perfect example of a nature-based solution of green infrastructure. That park is there to deal with stormwater overflows. The history of the West Side includes years of flooding and num number of homes that were negatively impacted by flooding in that area. And so Cook Park serves as a giant sponge for the West Side, that it can hold 
rain, storms, and let them slowly absorb down into the ground as opposed to flooding and, and spilling out into the neighboring community. So if you're over there today, you would likely see a, a pretty significant portion of the park underwater, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be doing. And that's an example of how we can use green infrastructure to build more resiliency around communities around the world. Reciting what you said about the funding for the students as well, because they too can get involved in these projects as they're here at Georgia Tech or any neighboring institutions mm -hmm. as well. We won't talk about the one that yeah. <laughs> way. And so thank you for, for that and, and that example. Um, what I'd like to turn to now is actually um, a little bit of uh, getting information from each of you about what does it look like when foundations are donating to universities um, and forming partnerships? Um, what is it that we should be looking for? What, what are the key criteria? And I think we would really distinguish the differences here already among these foundations that are here. Um, and so aside from the goals, but it's also the way action is delivered. And um, we'll start with you, Blair, and then go down. And I, I would love to have an answer to that question. Sure. You know, I think John's the one that um, taught me the saying, though, like, if you know one foundation, you know one foundation. <laughs> so every foundation is really idiosyncratic and really different, which I know is um, a challenge for the broader community, but it is also it's how it is. Um, at the Blake Foundation, we don't have, like, open RFPs, so there's not, like, a big call for proposals. Um, instead, it's much more of a relational giving. So, you know, we will reach out to grantees who we think really align with some of our strategic goals, or grantees will reach out to us if they think their work aligns with strategic goals. And we're also a really broad foundation. So, um, <clears throat> different parts of our organization have different kind of footprints. I mentioned that I work in the West and the Southeast. Um, other parts of our organization maybe just work in Georgia and Montana, or just Georgia, or just the west side in two specific neighborhoods. So that's just one thing to say, is that we're, we are a complex organization. Um, and the best kind of grants, are, in my opinion, are ones that like, genuinely align with the grantee's priorities and initiatives and goals and really advance what the grantee wants to be doing, whether that's a university or a nonprofit or anyone else that we're working with and also aligns with the Blank Foundation goals. Thank you. Yes, so for the Coca-Cola Foundation, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. In our history, we've awarded over $1.5 billion. Annually, we're awarding close to $100 million around the world. And what we look for, we, we evaluate proposals. We, we have a by invitation only uh, application process. And what we look for is we evaluate the organization's health, you know, how financially sound are they? What's their governance like? What are those factors that help us make sure that this is the right organization? The second thing we look at is the program itself. What is the impact of this work? What is that thing that we're hoping that aligns really closely with our initiative areas? And, and how do we look and think about the impact that this project is going to is going to deliver. And then the third area we look for is where is this community where this program is going to happen? What are the needs in that community? And how closely does this program align with the needs in that community? And that's where being a global company that has literally operations in virtually every country in the world, we can rely on our colleagues on the ground anywhere in the world to help make sure that this is an issue that's relevant to that community, and that this is approach that takes into consideration the, the way that community operates and what are the things that that community feels are important. So, so having that local presence on the ground really helps us be better stewards of our grant making. I like this question because it's an invitation to be blunt. Um, <laughs> peel back the curtain a little bit. What is honestly true is that the Ray C. Anderson Foundation is one of the hardest foundations to get grants from. And that's because our approach to our work is to have decided in January of each year where 95% of our dollars are gonna go each year. And it's because we've chosen to commit ourselves to four key initiatives. I've mentioned the Anderson Center in Drawdown, Georgia. There's two others, the Ray and the Biomimicry Institute's entrepreneurship work. We've been by their side for nearly a decade each, 
and continue to walk the path of doing good work with these initiatives, these organizations. And so we've earmarked our funding to continue to support them. And it's because each one is uniquely connected to the legacy of Ray Anderson in some way. Um, it's, it's true what Blair said, every foundation is a bit different and our approach has been to try to make significant deep impact in these four initiatives rather than spread ourselves a bit more broadly. But because of that, we feel that it's also incumbent upon us to try to provide more to the sustainability community that is so rich in the city and in this state than just be grant makers. Uh, just is the wrong word there. It's a critically important part for organizations to provide grants for really important work. But one of the most rewarding aspects of my job is that my trustees, my family, has tasked me with becoming a subject matter expertise on the issues we're involved in so that I can be an active partner in the work that we do with our grantees. And it's been really rewarding to become a part of the community as a result. Really good unpacking of how this works in your um, organization. Susanna. Well, if you've seen one foundation, you've seen one foundation, <laughs> as you can tell. And I would say that the Glenn Family Foundation, like blank, we don't have an open process. We don't have uh, uh, deadlines and, and calls for RFPs. We work mostly under relationships. Um, Family's been in Atlanta a long time, know a lot of people. People don't have a problem calling me. Uh, so that's not, uh, and, and they're out in the community serving on boards and, and you know building relationships and knowledge of, of what their interests are and what the community needs are. Um, in terms of, I'll focus just on the university question because um, we do a lot of funding of grassroots organizations and mid-sized nonprofit organizations across the city. But we, um, we've done a few things with universities. We have a long relationship at Emory. We fund the Glenn Family Breast Center there. We have um, done a lot of research funding for that organization. Uh, we fund some child psychiatry fellowships at Morehouse School of Medicine. We, um, one of our trustees uh, has a long uh, history. He's sort of a student of the Atlanta Civil Rights Movement and um, a, very highly regarded um, person who's been um, kind of pushing Atlanta over many years to lift up our history in the city, and that was how we got involved with the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. But long before that, actually, uh, he set up the Ivan Allen Prize for Social Courage to honor Mayor Ivan Allen, and, um, and that's an, uh, something that I think the foundation feels very proud of and, and been very happy that tech was willing to host that uh, prize. But all of those are, are areas where I, I feel the foundation has been more innovative in terms of pushing a university to do something new, um, something that it hadn't been doing before. And uh, often philanthropy can be really good risk capital. Um, and so um, in, in terms of just taking a chance on something new, a new idea, a new project, a new um, a new focus area that has been more of our relationships uh, in universities. In earlier iterations of the foundation, we did fund a lot of chairs. We, we have several endowed chairs at Emory. We um, have an endowed chair at uh, Indiana School of Philanthropy. We've, we've done a few of those kinds of things. I wouldn't say that my next generation leadership is so into that. Uh, and I think that's a bit of a function of the way younger people see the academy and, and the function of um, research universities. Um, and there just may be less, um, you know, as schools have grown their endowments, it seems like a family foundation like ours has less, um, less of a critical role to play. And uh, just very frankly, I mean, that's, that's just sort of the way the relationships have evolved. Um, and I'd, I'd say the same about healthcare. You know, it used to be family foundations would do a lot of funding at the hospital or the children's hospital or the, and, um, and I think because healthcare has become such a big business, it just feels like there's less need, less impact uh, for a, a smaller family foundation to have that kind of relationship. Um, so I hope that's. That's, <clears throat> that's perfect. And a couple of things I want to draw out there is that 
it's about the family foundation and the generations that come through that are trustees. And so that really is going to determine how things evolve at that particular foundation and a number of others. And also want to say thank you for the Ivan Allen Prize um, Fund that, that you've established. Um, just this, uh, just not a few weeks, just a few weeks ago, we awarded the 2024 Ivan Allen um, Junior Prize for Social Courage to Justice Robert Benham. Um, first African American to be appointed to the Supreme Court of Georgia, um, and that was in 1989 to, um, to 2020. Um, and he was the first African American to serve as Chief, Chief Justice between 1995 and 2001. And if I'm not mistaken, the year before was Christiana Mapur. And when she came, the students were just over the moon about her impact. And, um, she engaged so beautifully with them as well. So you see that impact, you used that word earlier, of how um, your fund and others are really making a difference. So that's just terrific. I think I'm getting the stare from Beryl because this is probably a good time to see if there are any questions from audience members. You have a microphone. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and, and please say your name and organization. Oh. I'm Jeanette Yen. I direct the Center for Biologically Inspired Design at Georgia Tech. And when Carlos said nature inspired solutions, I started making a list of everything that I could think of. <laughs> but it's different, slight. So my question to you is, I want examples of your nature-inspired solutions because in my head, I think of things like fog collection by the Namibian beetle, <laughs> desalination by the mangroves, streamlining and flying fish to keep your pipe flow, you know, streamlined. These are the things that I do as a bio-inspired designer and what I teach here. So I just wanted to hear examples. For us, it's things like reforestation efforts, it's mangrove protection or, or conservation work. It's also working on green infrastructure, like I gave an example of Cook Park being a, a solution to dealing with flooding. It's working on riparian zones, it's you know, bioswales. It's a number of, of interventions that could be deployed. Yeah, so using the environment exactly. to improve, because the environment for sure does sustainable practices. Exactly. So you're trying to amp mm -hmm. up there. Yep. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how nature works yeah. to see if we can work that way. We had a really interesting conversation last week with folks at the Nature Conservancy. They're working on a program. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the coast of Georgia has more marsh land than anywhere along the eastern seaboard. And that marshland is valuable. And they're doing, they're working, I'm not sure with who they're working with, but they're working with someone to do a, a calculation of the value of marsh. So they're modeling what happens with storm surge in places where there aren't marshes and where there are, so that they can ultimately build the case for a parametric insurance policy to protect those marshes. Again, we talked about that earlier with utilities, but this is now looking at the value of nature in really helping to protect storm surge. And so that's an area where we will certainly be having conversations with them as that work evolves. Mm -hmm. May I ask one question before I come to you? So um, we've you, you mentioned some projects, for example, in the west side. Um, so some of the biggest and most successful projects end up being public-private partnerships because there is private funding that is brought to the equation. I was wondering if you have um, models that you can talk about where um, the philanthropy is connected to some local NGO efforts and to um, industry, leading industry in a particular region, maybe for Blair or Carlos. Credits that nonprofits can actually take advantage of. So in the past, you had to have um, 
uh, tax liability at the end of the year. You had to owe the federal government money in order to take advantage of clean energy tax credits. Because the way tax credit works is if you owe the federal government $100, now you may owe them $80 because there's a, a reduction due to the tax credit. So nonprofits don't have um, that kind of liability to the federal government at the end of the year. So thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, you can now get a direct payment. So you don't have to owe them anything to get that $20 back for your clean energy project. So Capital Good Fund is launching a pilot project in Georgia to do um, rooftop solar leases to low and moderate income households at rates that are low enough to immediately begin to save those um, homeowners money. And so the way they're doing this is they're, they're, um, they're, they're leasing the, the rooftop solar panels so that they can claim the tax credits at the end of the year. Um, to try to reduce the cost. They also piece together a bunch of debt capital to try to be able to lease these channels. But even with all of those different things, they still weren't able to get the, the rates low enough that they could guarantee savings for customers. And so the Blake Foundation came in and gave them a grant so that now they didn't have to get as much debt from banks um, so that they could actually have a, a system where they could guarantee savings to low modern income households for this rooftop solar system. So it was really a combination of federal tax credits, private um, banking or um, lenders, and philanthropic capital that was able to put together this capital stack to be able to launch this program. That's an excellent example. One more question, thank you. Good morning, um, Jairo Garcia with the School of City and Regional Planning. So thank you so much um, for, uh, for the great presentations. Um, and I just want to give another example uh, uh, from the Ray C. Anderson Foundation and the Clean Foundation with, uh, with the grant uh, with the Throwdown Georgia. I, I was a volunteer consultant with um, Deco Action and they just received the grant. So thank you so much. Eco Action is an organization that operates at the west side of the city, and um, I, I help them to put the, the proposal together, and they're going to be able to access fresh food grow here in Atlanta uh, with um, access to micro mobility. So thanks to that grant, they were able to do that, which we eliminate several problems, including uh, food deserts and, and, and mobility inside the neighborhood. Uh, but I want to touch the um, very touchy aspect about, you know, we talk about climate resilience, which, you know, I work on that, I'm expert on that. And then we know that to climate resilience, uh, some organizations that are working to you are working in what we call um, a climate resilience. And the climate resilience includes microgrids, for instance, and solar panels. Um, but we, I mean, I stay away from that because here in Georgia, we cannot do that. We have a piece of legislation that basically forbidden to do that. And I'm not gonna name that company we has the name of Georgia, but it's not from Georgia, it's from Alabama, recently make an announcement that they are gonna oppose any um, a community solar in Georgia. So, I mean, there is a huge obstacle. We, we, can, we can talk about that. We can say, you know, we want to make the city of Atlanta and those communities that are being affected with energy burden resilient. But we have this a huge legislation and this opposing a company that is making money by wasting energy we're not gonna go anywhere. So I just wonder if you have those conversations inside of your organizations, and then maybe you see a light at the end of the tunnel to make our communities more resilient and um, eliminate energy burden. Uh, if you wanna also address the climate action plan um, and what's happening there as well. Yeah, I can speak to two things. One that directly addresses uh, the, the tension that Jairo speaks to there and through the lens of philanthropic organizations, and then the good news, because my answer to Hiro is bad news. Um, it is difficult for philanthropic organizations to put themselves at the forefront of policy disputes, which often is the case when it comes to what's gonna be permissible around how we generate and move electricity in our state. Yeah, there, there is a better way to do so many aspects of our energy system, and there are vested interests in preventing that change from happening. Uh, our role tends to be to, if it's a, aligned with our priorities, to find the sorts of organizations who can do a bit of effective work in that space. And an example right now is the fact that there's a new um, filing by Georgia Power with the Public Service Commission to revisit their integrated resource plan. 
because they are saying there's a surge in demand, and so now we need to build more natural gas-fired power plants and import more coal-fired power from other states. There are lots of organizations that are standing up in front of the Public Service Commission to say, we believe that there's a better way. And support for those types of organizations, keeping them as thriving is perhaps the most impactful thing that we can do to enhance the important conversations that are being had at, in halls like the Public Service Commission. Uh, but now the good news piece. There is other ways that our work can end up being impactful, and, and the story I'll tell here briefly is an example of being lucky. Well, that, that's the wrong way to phrase it. It's an example of making a grant where the people who received it did way more than you thought they would. And so Dr. Marilyn Brown and Bill Drummond are the lead researchers for Drawdown Georgia's research. And last year, they had the opportunity to work with Georgia's Department of Natural Resources on developing the first state-level climate action plan. That was made possible by federal funds that came about under the Inflation Reduction Act administered by the EPA. It's a program called the Carbon Pollution Reduction Grants. And great, we're gonna have two new plans, one for the state and one for the city region, metropolitan Atlanta, led by the Atlanta Regional Commission. And they're using the Drawdown Georgia research as the main backbone of their plan on which climate solutions can do the most good. If not for Drawdown Georgia's research, we wouldn't have these plans that are coming out. What good is a plan would be a very fair question to ask at this point. Well, this particular federal opportunity is two stages. First, you get money to make a plan. That's what's happening right now. Second, if you make a plan, you get to apply for a piece of $4.6 billion to implement it. And the state of Georgia is going to be seeking more than $100 million of federal funds to implement climate solutions in the state. It's an example of, in our case, like we got lucky. We bet on some horses that had a really good race to run, and it was the researchers who found the way to make their research actionable in the halls of uh, policy. And a big part of that is because we're at a once in a lifetime opportunity given the federal funds that are now available to do the work that needs to happen. Excellent, and wow, have we run out of time, and I'm sure that there's so much more that we could discuss, talk about, questions to feel, but thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention. As I said at the beginning, this is an initiative sponsored by the University Global Coalition, coordinated by President Angel Cabrera, and as a gift to our panelists, um, he has an autographed copy of the Higher Education and SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals. Um, and so to each one of our panelists, let's thank uh, Blair thank and Carlos. Thank you. Sorry, John, they didn't tell me that would happen. And, and Susanna, please let's thank our panelists for this terrific <laughs> morning. <laughs>